for example, like I've got, I got the customer on the phone and I put the information into the computer. That's a value-add activity because I'm physically transforming customer requests into information. Okay? Or if it's a product, you know, cutting steel, and molding the product, cutting a product, or working a product, and actually physically transforming it qualifies as change. We're actually changing something. Okay? Moving it from here to there and not changing it isn't adding any value. Sitting in the inbox waiting for somebody to look at isn't adding any value. All right? So that's the first question. Does it physically change something about this step, this piece of our business process? The second is this. Will our customers pay for that? Could I get out an invoice and list this specific activity on an invoice and show that to my customer, and would they say, oh, yeah, I'll sign up for paying that? That's the second test. Will somebody pay for it? Customer in particular. Okay? And then the third one is, is it done right the first time? Or is this step a form of rework? In other words, I'm actually double-checking it to see if everything got done right the first time. Sorry, that does not qualify as a value-add activity. Because if I'm your customer, I don't want to have to pay for you to work on it again. I wanted you to do it right the first time. I'm going to teach you that value stream mapping is like many other tools in Lean Six Sigma. This is not an out-of-the-box, one-size-fits-all proposition. It's a tool, and we can scale it and modify it and polymorph it infinitely for the problem at hand. So you can literally do a value stream map at lunch on a napkin and get a lot of benefit. Or you can spend weeks, as I've done, value stream, map value stream mapping everything about an automotive assembly plant and every single opportunity inside a big three automotive plant. You can't do that on a napkin, right? That's $100,000 worth of effort just to get to the map. The person will be the A partner and the other person will be the B partner. So what I'd like you to first do is form teams of two and then I'll give further instructions. So find a partner and agree on who's the A and who's the B. Raise your hand if you need a partner. Raise your hand if you need a partner. A, A, hold your hands up. A, A, gotta see those hands. Everybody's got the hands Okay, so we're gonna take turns, right? We're gonna share with each other what we're, A, keep your hands up, A. Point at the B and say, you're going first. <laughs> Bingo. Thank you so much. So shopping online, they have the required fields. And if anything's missing, it stops you, makes you go back and correct it before you proceed. So that's a wonderful example. And we look at this data. And we look at the data and say, okay, pilot A didn't miss left, didn't miss right, wasn't too short, not too far up the runway, everything looks good, right? Or it's good. So far, so good. Ah, let's continue to capture voice of the process data, and let's understand what happens with pilot B. And we record the skid marks for pilot B. Test question. Who do you want flying your airplane? B. Who? B. Might it be? Why? More accurate. A lot more accurate, right? So we take a look at the dispersion on pilot A, and you know what? Maybe you could end up missing at some point, right? But wait! I can add up, I can get the coordinates for all the A skid marks and all the coordinates for B. I can put them in a spreadsheet. I can divide them and average them. And what would the average skid mark value be for pilot A? And I can tell you it's going to be right smack in the middle of the runway. The average value for pilot A is right smack in the middle of that runway. So on average, A is just as good as B. So what's your problem? Here's the deal. We are customers for processes every day. We don't feel averages, do we? We feel the variation, right? We feel the variation.